Last week, I told you that we were going to be in a two-part series. We kind of left you hanging in suspense when the centurion, a Roman soldier, asked Jesus for some help right after Jesus got done teaching the Sermon on the Mount. The crowd was going wild because Jesus just healed a man who was diseased with leprosy, and then he's confronted by a centurion. He's confronted by hate itself. He's confronted by something that would have been a soft spot in anybody's life in that moment. So let's read that again in Matthew 8, verse 5. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Last week we said it's kind of ironic that a man known for inflicting suffering is now worried about someone's suffering. And Jesus answers him and says to him, shall I come and heal him? In Mike McKelvey terms, he's like, let's get it done. Let's go. Let's get it done. Am I going to your house or are you bringing him here? What's up? Where are we going? And the crowd and the disciples are like, Jesus, are you crazy? What are you doing? Ready? And this is what they're really saying. Jesus, he's not one of us. He's not one of us. And I just got to throw this in there. It's so easy once we become Christians, once we become members of a church, to begin to learn Christianese. You ever speak Christianese? Christianese, someone says, hey man, how you doing? I'm blessed and highly favored of the Lord, brother. How about you? I'm like, dude, do you talk like that at work? Like, what? Blessed and highly favored of the Lord, brother. Like, that doesn't make sense, but it makes sense in church. And church is like, well, I like church for us, but I don't know if everybody should be in church. I think some people need to clean up their behavior, you know, because some sins are worse than others. And once they work on that sin, then they, because after, I don't want to sit next to them. And that's what this guy is saying. These are what this, the crowd is kind of saying. Like, Jesus, we understand that you said that you need to go into the world and preach the gospel. We get that you said love your enemy. But you surely didn't mean him. Not him. Like, you were talking about when we get in a fight with our friend and we're frenemies for like five seconds. Like, I deleted you from Facebook and then I'm going to add you back next week. Like, that's what you meant, right? Not people who actually kill us. Stay away from him, Jesus. Jesus, this is a setup. Jesus, come here. We're not, we're not saying that we're conspiracy theorists, but he might be trying to get you alone so that they can take you out. You know, it's, the government could be setting this whole thing up. Come on, somebody. This is so apropos for the moment in the world that we're in. We don't even know what's going on around us, right? And we have all these questions. Then the soldier says something to Jesus that rocks the crowd. In Matthew 8, 8, the centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve you to come under my roof. And at that, the whole crowd's like, finally, somebody's saying something that's making sense up in here. That's right, he don't deserve our Jesus. But then he goes on, but just say the word. Just speak the word, and my servant will be healed. Amen. I just got to throw this out. Are you speaking the word over your circumstances? Are you speaking the word over your body? Are you speaking the word over your marriage? Are you speaking the word over your children? Are you speaking the word over your job? Are you speaking the word or are you just begging God to do more for you? That's different. It's different. This man understands authority. He understands the authority of Jesus that if you speak it, it will come into existence. Jesus, just speak the word over my situation 
and it will be done. And what shocks the crowd is Jesus' response. In Matthew 8, 10, Jesus says, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed. And as I was writing this this week and I was sharing this with my staff, I always preach, I try to preach my sermon on Thursdays to my staff so that if I say something, they can correct me then and I put it in my notes. As I was writing this, I began to think of my life. I'm 41 years old. And I wonder if I've done anything to ever amaze God. He says, and Jesus was amazed at this guy who was a chief sinner. One of the worst people around. Jesus is amazed by him. And I, I, just, I just wonder if like, if I ever went through the, I'm gonna date myself, the microfiche. <laughs> Anybody know that? Yep. Oh, you just, didn't, you, didn't just, you just didn't write a paper back in. If you're older than 40, you know what microfiche is if you ever wrote a paper. I wonder if I went back through the, the articles of my life and the situations I've been in, if I ever would pin a moment in my life where I said, I think that one might have amazed God. Not that I was getting down on myself, but I was like, man, this guy who's like in a really bad spot, he like he's not a good person, he amazed Jesus. And said to those following him, so now he's telling everybody, he's telling his 12 apostles, the guys who are going to go out and start every church that's ever existed, truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Ouch! Jesus, I left my fishing boats and my family's career to come follow you. That's not faith. I ha Listen, let me, how, how do I say it differently? I haven't seen such faith in all of Israel. Peter. John. Not you. Not you. Not you. This guy. This guy understands what's up. This guy understands the kingdom of God. And, and, and he's a sinner. Sin, like beyond sinner, like doesn't deserve Christian. This can't be so. Jesus, you can't say, well done, thou good and faithful, to this guy. Are you serious? I'm working so hard to be Christian, and I'm not sure I'm going to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, and turn your rest, and you're telling this guy? <laughs> He's not like us, Jesus. Matthew 8, 13 goes on. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go. Let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed in that moment. His servant was healed in that moment. And I'm totally making this up. But I think when, after Jesus finishes saying those words, he kind of does this. I think he gives this little smile, this little smirk. Bet you guys didn't see that coming. Bet you didn't see me doing that today. Jesus knew it was coming. Before the foundation of the earth, God prepared a moment that this centurion would have faith greater than any other. Jesus knew that this was going to happen, but no one else did. And then the story just kind of ends. Jesus just packs up, he heads to Peter's house, and they have lunch. And the crowd stands there stunned. Stunned. What? did we just witness? We're allowed to do that? And they're processing. They're thinking like, he preached this to us on the sermon, on the Sermon on the Mount, and his deeds matched his words. He meant what he said. 
he didn't just simply say something and say, do what I say, not what I do. He said, follow my lead. I'm going to teach you the instructional side, but I'm also going to demonstrate unto you what it means to be in the kingdom of God. Just throw this out there today. Do your deeds match your words? Few simple things. I'm not looking at anybody in particular. I'm looking at people online. (laughs) If you say you're going to be somewhere at a specific time, are you there on time? Or do you make some kind of joke out of it? Well, you know what kind of time I'm on. Late? Liar? Waste my time time? Like, like I, I, don't, I don't get where, ever, where that ever became funny that you gave your word to be somewhere on time, but then you felt no urgency to keep your word. I was raised that a man's word, this is a scripture, a man's word is more valuable than gold. Come on, somebody. I know, I know we don't want to hear that kind of stuff, but this is what these people were amazed about. He said something, and he did what he said. He told us something that was difficult. He told us something that was hard, but he did it himself. He wasn't like the other religious leaders who were full of whitewashed bones, the Bible says, whitewashed tombs. They were all words, but they didn't live the life. They did all this fasting, they did all these works, but they didn't live it in their everyday lives. And that's the fallacy of being Christian. Well, all I had to do is pray the prayer, right? No. We were never called to be Christian. We were called to follow the leader, to follow his lead. Jesus' words were more than simple hashtags. Hashtag, hashtag goals, hashtag love your neighbor, hashtag, and then I'm going to get in somebody's business. Can I get in somebody's business? I'm there. Do you really LOL when you LOL? I don't know if I ever LOL'd when I typed LOL. It was just one of those things like, oh, that was funny, but eh. I'm going to give you a pity laugh. So I'll just say LOL. Eh. Funny, eh. But here's what's happened with that, because I'm a chronic LOLer that doesn't actually LOL. Here's the fallacy with that. When you get a text message and someone says, or, or you see a Facebook message and it says, Please pray for my brother. He's in the hospital. And then we just send the emoji of the hands. I want to comment on every single person who did that. Could you tell me what you prayed exactly? What were the actual words that came out of your mouth when you told me you prayed? Nothing! You didn't say a darn word! You didn't say a thing. You just wrote back praying for you. What you really meant was, I'm going to think about you for this one second and I'm going to forget about you 10 seconds later. That's what you really that's what you really did. And that wasn't Jesus. If he LOL, he LOL'd. <laughs> if he said praying for you, he stopped. He stopped everything. He said, suffer not the little children to come unto me. Let me pray for you. His words matched his deeds. His deeds matched his words. Jesus wasn't like the person who says, praying for you, but doesn't. He wasn't the Christian who saw someone stranded on the side of the road waiting for help and did pray for them. I call that the Christian drive-by. The Christian drive-by. Someone's on the side of the road, Lord, send laborers. 
I did. You were there. That's, see, that's, that's Christian, though. That, that's Christian. I'm going to pray for you from a distance. And Jesus says, I get praying, but praying's between me and you. Go do something for them. Help your neighbor. This is the Sermon on the Mount. Here's some heavy news today. Here's some heavy news today. Ready? Jesus literally expect us, expects us to do good to those who won't and don't do good to us. He literally expects it. He literally expects it. It wasn't an idea. It wasn't a philosophy. It wasn't the Christian mantra. He literally expects you to do good for the centurion who might later kill him. And that's the truth of the matter. We don't know who this centurion is. He's part of the Roman guard. He might have been on the team that actually later crucifies Jesus. Yet, in that moment, he did good for his enemy. He literally, Jesus literally expects us to love and do good to those who do not look like us or act like us. He expects you to love a person who lives a lifestyle that is despicable to you. He literally expects you to love them. He literally expects you to love them and to do good for them. He expects us to do good to those who don't even like us. but we don't actually think he meant these things literally, right? I mean, he meant it like while we're in church, while we're at home. He didn't read this for strangers, right? Now we understand a week ago today when I said it's easy to be Christian but it means something totally different to be a Jesus follower. Because here's what we know. It's easy to love people who look like me. It's easy to love people who think like me. It's easy to love people who live like me. And it's easy to love people who agree with me. Because it's easier to be a Christian than a Jesus follower. And listen, if Christian is what we choose to be over being a Jesus follower, I'm going to say it this way. If we choose being a Christian over being a Jesus follower, then we are actually contributing to the problem in society today. We're, we're still sitting back and saying, well, they're wrong and they're wrong and they're wrong, but see, we've chose to be Christian, not a Jesus follower. We're wrong. We're wrong. Because a Jesus follower was sent to this earth in this generation to be a solution not merely a mouthpiece to point out problems. Anybody can be a siren pointing out trouble. But a follower of Jesus will be a catalyst for change. They will be the catalyst for solving problems. I'm going to throw something out there today. Probably get more hate mail. But I was attacked pretty hard by some people on social media, by some Christians, for being part of a rally. Being part of a rally surrounded by people who did not look like me. They did not have the same skin color as me. 
They didn't have the same signs as me. They, 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 they had different moral values than me. They were protesting different things than me. And I was attacked pretty hard. How could this man of God, this Christian, be in a place like that? I wonder what it looked like on social media when Jesus was sitting next to the Samaritan woman at the well. I wonder what that social media post would have looked like. I wonder what all the church people were saying when Jesus is sitting next to this woman, ministering strength and life to her. What was the tweet that day? Huh? See, because it's so, we're so quick to judge when someone's in a position that we don't have the guts to do. Not a single of the 12 apostles had the guts to walk through Samaritan, Samaritan. But Jesus said, we must go through. We must go. I have a date with someone who doesn't deserve me, who doesn't want me, and I'm going to be judged wrongly for it, but I must go. I must go. I wonder what that looked like. And here's the tough reality. If we do not choose to be a Jesus follower, then we will be content simply with the word believe. Believe. I believe in Jesus. I believe he's good. I believe Christianity is right. I believe that was a good sermon. I believe that that's good for Pastor Mike to do. Being a Christian, if, we're, if we choose to just be a Christian and not a Jesus follower, we will be content with just believe. You will believe Scripture. You will believe the Bible. You will believe in Jesus. You will believe that all men are created equal. You'll believe all sorts of things. But if you do not decide in your heart to be a follower of Jesus, then it just ends there. It just ends with belief and no action. No action. Oh, man. If we decide to not follow Jesus, then we will not act. We will not show love to those around us. We'll actually feel, see, a Christian, a Christian has the right to be offended and make a social media comment that hurts other people. A Jesus follower does not. A Jesus follower does not. They do not. A Jesus, follower may, a Jesus follower says, this bothers me, this hurts me, but I don't need to inflict more pain. Someone said something that hurt me, I don't need to react. I don't need to respond. I don't need to go tit for tat. I do not need to uh, 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 eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. I need to love and show consistent love. I just want to know this today, and I'm not trying to give you too heavy this is just a challenge to me in this generation right now. We're in a generation right now where the church needs to act, where the church needs to rise up. The church does not need to be sit back in fear and wonder like, well, I'm just gonna wait for everything else in the universe to make decisions for me. After all, Pastor, I'm like, God's in control. See, that's, that's the biggest problem with Christianity is that we say God's in control so we don't think that we have any part to play in our lives. God is in control of what you give him control of. But the things in your life that you have not surrendered to him, he is not in control of them. You are. <laughs> All right. I wonder today, can you be the answer to someone struggling right now? Can you be the healing hands of Jesus to your neighbor right now? Can you be words of comfort to someone around you that's hurting? Can you go the extra mile? Because true belief 
needs to lead to action. Jesus said, do good. He did not say, believe good. He said, do good unto those who spitefully use you and persecute you. He said, he didn't say, believe good about them. He said, do something. Be the difference. And here's the deal. Jesus saw all this coming. You got to understand today. Those in the room and those online, you got to understand this today. Jesus saw COVID-19 happening in the design of the world. He saw that there would be a day that a pandemic would be released, that there would be shutdowns, that the church at large would simply disappear and then have to rebuild. And he chose, and I'm not trying to get too end time prophecy on you all, I could really freak you all out if we did that. I believe one of my jobs is I'm called to be a watcher. Bible talks about a watchman on the wall, a watcher of the times. Anyway, I'm not gonna get too into depth, but I just wanna say this today. God chose from the foundation of the earth to have you to be alive in this generation for this time. If he saw this happening and he saw you going through it, then he must see that you have the strength, the power, the anointing, the courage, the calling, the wisdom to make it through this and not only make it through it, but rebuild the church in America in a way that's right. I don't want to rebuild a broken church. I don't want to rebuild a church full of backbiting and backstabbing and gossip. We have an opportunity to build the new modern church according to the Sermon on the Mount. He saw all this coming. He knew that this day would happen. And so he made sure that he left instructions for every single one of us so that we would not just be hearers, but doers. Not just listening, but acting. Not just believing, but making it happen. Jesus' final words in the Sermon on the Mount, and I'm bringing it all together the last nine minutes. He says this in Matthew 7, 26. But anyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is a foolish man. Yo, this is, I gotta take the glasses off for that. <laughs> this is the guy who said, call no man a fool. And he just said, if you do not put the Sermon on the Mount into practice, you're a fool. Some of the strongest words Jesus is ever using, if you hear the Sermon on the Mount and do not do it, you're a fool. See, everybody heard it. Most people agreed with it. They were moved by it. It was one of the kind of, like, I felt that in my gut, pastor. But then when they left the moment, they left the mountain, they got down to real life. Because after all, Pastor Mike, it's easy to get excited while we're all together in church. But you ain't going to my job with me tomorrow to give me a pep talk. That ain't the real life, Pastor Mike. Jesus says the person who feels that way is a fool. They are fool because they're fooling themselves. This is what he's saying. They're fooling themselves. Ready? They fool themselves into thinking that they are better than they really are. These people who believe they have found favor with God, but they really don't possess it. And so Jesus closes out with a last sentence. He says, they are a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. What does this sentence mean? This sentence means that they built a beautiful life. They were successful. 
They were maybe rich. They had a beautiful marriage. They had beautiful kids. They drove a nice car. They owned their own business. But God was never in it. They built a beautiful life, but there was no foundation. They believed. They heard the words. They wanted the blessings. But they did not build it on Jesus. It was a Chip and Joanna Gaines kind of life. It was legit. It was amazingly beautiful. But Matthew 7, 26 and 27 says, The man who built his house on the sand, the rain came, and the streams rose, and the winds blew, and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. I'm a Christian! But then COVID happened and we fall apart. That's the sermon right there. That's the sermon right there. Yeah, but I go to church every week, but you never built faith. You never did the word. And so when every circumstance in life happens, you fall apart. You crash into the river of circumstance and are washed away. Somebody got to tweet that. The men and women who make a difference in the world are not the people who believe right. The people who make a difference in the world are the people who act and react when something isn't right. I need an amen over there, bro. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. The people who make a difference are the ones who act and react when something around them isn't right. I need to be the solution when something needs to be done, when something new has to happen. So let's close with this idea today. Do you love your neighbor? Well, Pastor Mike, you don't know my neighbor. (laughs) Their dog keeps going to the bathroom on my lawn. See, we'll never love our enemy if we can't simply love our neighbor. Here's my challenge once again. Let's not be content with being Christian. Let's follow. Let's continue to do what Jesus said. In John 14, 12, Jesus says this, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing. And here's the promise. Here's the promise. This blows my mind. And they will do even greater things because I'm going to the Father. He says, oh, yo, in the book of John, it says, listen, if we wrote down everything Jesus did, the world couldn't contain the books. And then he says, yeah, but you know what? If you do what I've been doing and do the Sermon on the Mount, you'll do even greater works than anything I've been able to do. He said greater works, not greater beliefs. He said greater works, not greater church services. Not greater sermons that we agree with. Greater action. Be followers of Jesus. I want to read this sermon, uh, this scripture to you today. And it starts with, but God. But God demonstrated. God acted. God put his words into action. But God acted. God demonstrated his own love for us in this ready while we were still centurions oh don't think that that story wasn't about you you were the centurion story not the disciple at one point in your life at one point in our lives. While we were yet sinners, centurions, the worst of the worst, Christ died for us. Well, Pastor Mike, you know, I know that you can't lump us all together because like, I was actually like a really good person like my whole life, like I've always done the right thing. Your pride smells horrible. No, you weren't. Your righteousness, the Bible says, is a filthy rags. Your ability to be good is filthy, dirty. 
stinky. Huh. You ready for this? When Jesus was raised from the dead, when Jesus was raised from the dead and he calls out to you and me, those in this room watching later, he calls out when, when, when the trumpet sounds, he says, follow me. Follow me. Follow me. Everything that he's always said was, follow me. He, he ascends, he sits at the right hand of the Father, follow me. When the trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ shall rise, and those who are uh, here will call to be with them together. He says, follow me into your rest. Today, if you would follow him, we would astonish the world. We would astonish the world with a brand of love that will change everything. We can change the issues in our society today with a new brand of love. Not a new brand of talk. Not a new brand of comment. I want to place an invitation in your heart today that maybe you have a belief system but not a faith walk. You have a belief system but not a faith walk. You've settled for Christian but you've not grabbed a hold of the garment of Jesus and followed him. The thing is this, Jesus never invited anyone to be a Christian. He invited us to follow. Maybe you're here today and you just heard what he said about following Jesus and you said, I've never followed Jesus. Today we're gonna pray a prayer together as a family, everyone in this room, and you today can make the choice to follow Jesus. Maybe you've followed everything else and you've gone in so many different directions with your life, but you only ended up in a dead end. Today is your day of salvation. Pray this prayer. Repeat it after me. We're all going to pray this together. God, I come to you in Jesus' name. And I thank you for sending Jesus to die for me and rise again. Jesus, I believe and I will follow you. You are the Son of God. You are Lord. And I thank you for your free gift of salvation today. In your name I pray. Amen.